Okay. Good evening and welcome to the Faculty Research Seminar of SICE Europe. My name is Eric Jones and I'm Professor of European Studies. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that we like to do at SICE Europe is to showcase the talent that we're able to attract uh, in, into the program uh, and, and also the insights that they're able to bring and the connections that they're able to bring uh, to help us better understand the world around us. So rather than use the opportunity to speak to you myself, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Alessandro Merli. Uh, Alessandro Merli is an associate fellow of the Bologna Institute for Policy Research. I don't think we have the senior associate title, but if we did, he would be a senior associate fellow. Uh, and, and, and he comes to us having been the lead correspondent at Il Sole 24 Ore, which is it, Italy's premier financial newspaper, uh, responsible for covering in his last post uh, the European Central Bank and German politics, all from Frankfurt. Uh, and in that capacity, he played a leading role in watching the European Central Bank as it developed through its most important period uh, since the founding of the euro as a single currency. Um, now, when Alessandro decided to leave Il Sole 24 Ore, he had, I should add, been a journalist with them also in the United States and in Brazil. Uh, he speaks uh, fluent Portuguese, um, but, but even more important, he started life as a real journalist covering sports. In other words, the part of the paper that people actually read. Uh, and, and, and he continues to cover sports. So if they ever hold Wimbledon again, uh, you can expect him to be there uh, covering it in quotation marks uh, while enjoying the tennis. Uh, having said that, um, what we've managed to do is to get Alessandro to work with us and to help us better to understand uh, what's going on at the European Central Bank. Uh, and he's brought along some of his friends uh, who are also our friends too, uh, who are, <coughs> who are going to explain the most important challenge that central banks face right now, which is central banking communications. Believe it or not, uh, we now want our central bankers to speak in complete sentences that people can understand. And it turns out that that's harder uh, than anybody could have imagined. Uh, with that short introduction, I'm going to hand over to Alessandro and he'll introduce our speaker and guide us through the rest of the evening. Alessandro, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you, Eric. Uh, no tennis tonight, unfortunately. We'll be talking about uh, European Central Bank uh, and Central Bank Communication. Uh, title of this talk is Building Trust in Uncertain Times. To do that, uh, we have with us Gabriel Glockler, uh, and uh, I'll come to him in a minute. Uh, first, uh, I'll uh, I'll just, as, as, uh, as Eric said, I'll just explain how new uh, communication is to uh, central banks. Uh, that's why uh, it is so difficult to, to master for some central bankers and why it has become uh, a tool uh, of, of the greatest uh, uh, importance. Uh, back a few decades, not so many, in uh, the 30s, the governor of the Bank of England uh, a gentleman named Montague Norman had a motto. His motto was never explain and never apologize uh, so much for communication. So the secretiveness was one of the main characteristics of, of central banking. Even much later, when I started covering central banks in the 80s, uh, the head of the Fed was Paul Volcker of the Federal Reserve in the United States. He hardly ever uh, spoke to the uh, public and uh, never to the press if he could uh, avoid it. The central bank governor in Italy, the governor of the Bank of Italy, spoke to the public maybe two or three times uh, a year at uh, set piece uh, uh, occasion. Uh, the following phase was obfuscation. Uh, Alan Greenspan at the, at the Federal Reserve again uh, had a famous or infamous quote that said, if I turn to be particularly clear, uh, you must have misunderstood what I said. So uh, it, the purpose was actually to obfuscate, not to clarify what the central bank, uh, uh, the central bank was doing. And then central bank developed their own jargon or their own uh, code words. Uh, Jean-Claude Trichet was... Uh, uh, the second uh, president of the, of the European Central Bank used to have this code word saying vigilance, strong vigilance, and that normally, uh, you know, was the precursor of some movement in, in, uh, in interest rate. But then, of course, the world has changed. Uh, central banks have realized that uh, 
communication could be a very powerful tool. Uh, Mario Draghi, uh, the, the last but uh, the last before this one, uh, president of the central bank, uh, uh, had this masterpiece of saying that he will do whatever it takes uh, uh, to save the euro. And actually, his words uh, were good enough, and he didn't actually have to act on them. Uh, and that was enough uh, for the markets and for the public. Uh, that was in the summer of 2012, when uh, a lot of people thought that the euro would disintegrate very, very quickly. So uh, communications become very prominent in the, in the central bank uh, toolbox, also because the world around central bank have changed. Uh, first, uh, it was enough to uh, maybe talk to no press at all or talk to a few newspapers. Now you have wire services like Bloomberg or Reuters that uh, uh, report every single sentence or every single comma that central banks pronounce and markets react uh, basically instantaneously. And even as the public is concerned, you know, with the role of social media, everybody today has become a commentator on economics and everybody's a commentator even on on central banking policy. So central banks had to adapt and to uh, explain that to us, uh, especially at this time when everything's so uncertain about the uh, economy and the future path of, uh, uh, of monetary policy. Uh, we have uh, Gabriel Gluckler and uh, Gabriel is a very seasoned central banker. He had been with the ECB basically from its foundation in 1999. Uh, he's covered a number of senior management role there. Uh, he's in the senior management uh, in the Director General of Communication. Uh, he's also a visiting professor at the, uh, at the College of Europe and has taken over the co-leadership of uh, the research and policy network on central bank communication, which I'm also uh, a, a member, which was formed by uh, think tank in London, uh, the Center for Economic Policy Research, uh, with the help of the European Central Bank. So, uh, without further ado, I'll give the floor to uh, Gabriel, Central Bank Communication. Thank you very much indeed for this uh, kind introduction. And I start off immediately um, by uh, showing you my screen. I hope this will work now. Um, Okay, very nice. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, I would have loved to have been uh, with you in Bologna. Unfortunately, it was not to be because we are living in these uncertain times. And, and, uh, and this is our environment in which we operate, um, trying to rebuild trust to project certainty at a time of enormous uncertainty. Uh, these are some of the extra things that now come on top of the normal issues of central bank communication that Alessandro already referred to. Um, now, as he, what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit why it matters, and then look a little bit at what the landscape is, how things have changed, um, and then how we're trying to rebuild trust. Trust will be a central element that I will refer to, um, uh, to by communicating more, in fact, but also communicating differently. Um, and then as we move into this uh, idea of how central banks should communicate, we have to ask ourselves, who are we trying to reach here? Um, is it the people or is it the markets? And, uh, and whether we are going to try to reach people's minds or whether we also, as a central bank, believe it or not, would like to reach people's hearts. And maybe uh, uh, in this pandemic, I think a few things also changed about communication in Europe more generally. And I just close with that and as a, as a little uh, outlook for that. Now, as Alessandro already mentioned, um, words of central bankers matter big time and probably nothing more so uh, than, uh, than the famous quote of Mario Draghi, the famous whatever, it, it takes speech. And this is just uh, by way of an, of an example of how our markets can react, how billions of euros and dollars can be shifted because uh, a central banker has said something. Um, now, in, uh, in the Spider-Man, Uncle Ben says to Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility. And precisely because what what central bank says has such an outsized impact on financial markets, um, on banks' values and their stability, on the, on, the, on the overall stability of the financial system, but also the broader economy, whether you know, a, a recession is perceived to be around the corner or whether the boom is coming. 
all of this has, has an enormous impact ultimately on people's economic decisions, so where to spend, where to borrow, where to invest, and ultimately also on their wealth. And precisely for that reason, many central bankers said, like, we've got to be extremely, extremely careful about what we say and, uh, and, and how we say it, and have therefore been uh, very uh, uh, secretive about this. Now, um, uh, uh, Alessandro already referred to the famous to the famous quote, never explain, never apologize. We have a few other uh, fantastic quotes from that era. Uh, the deputy governor who said, it's a dangerous thing to start to give reasons. And in fact, another beautiful one is what the role of the communication department in the central bank was to keep the bank out of the press and the press out of the bank. So the idea was really to, to uh, stay in this relative obscurity where sometimes even markets had to find out what the decision was, how rates were changing through the market movements because the, the central bank wouldn't even communicate its own decision. It was for markets to find out. And now we've moved into a completely new era where, as Mario Draghi said, uh, communication is not only the heart of policy, it's become a tool of policy. And our new president, Christine Lagarde, who goes one step further and says, it's not only about markets, it's about the people. It's a public good. We are the custodian of this currency, and we must make sure that people understand what we're doing um, because we do it on their behalf. So the real question is why this massive change and what are, what are the, the reasons for that? And I would group them in two uh, big uh, kind of uh, chapters, so to speak. The one is what's happening to the communications landscape, and the other thing is what's happening to the general external and political environment in which central banks operate. Let's start with the first one. I think we all can all agree that there's kind of a, a communications revolution underway, aided by digitalization, uh, by this participatory nature in which people now consume, comment, uh, Alessandro referred to it. Everything is public. It's almost impossible to control the message. There's a 24-7, 365 day news cycle. Um, people are requesting deeper insights and transparency about how public officials uh, uh, behave. Um, what they're doing, there's an extreme attention to detail, um, and, and, and there's, in fact, a, a wealth of information and a poverty of attention. Let me run you through some of these, just to give you an example of what this means. The central bank, the ECB in particular, is surrounded by, lately, a very controversial discourse. I show you some things here that also show you how far this goes. On the left, you see Mario Draghi depicted as Count Dragula. There's actually a, a, a newspaper uh, I show you here. Can you see that? Whoops, yes. A uh, newspaper cover of a similar thing that came out in the German news. Um, uh, that uh, uh, you, you have another German one here that's about Madame Lagarde who experiments with your money, um, allegedly thinking about green monetary policy. You have uh, the Greek one that says basically that uh, uh, Mario Draghi is now a poodle of Angela Merkel. And then you have uh, an Irish paper here that uh, uh, is very upset about, uh, about the ECB's role in the Troika and, and basically has, has, a, has a, a particular view about what the ECB thinks about maybe austerity, whether it's self-defeating and so on and so forth. All the way to, uh, to the one on the right that sees the ECB and independence stay like an alien spaceship that hovers over, over the world and, and who knows what it has in mind. Um, the, the critique comes from all sorts of places uh, and sometimes a very different views. The Germans are, are concerned about the so-called expropriation of savers. Um, they're wondering uh, about what low interest rates will do to banks and insurers. Um, we've had a court case. Uh, there's people who believe what the ECB does or has done lately is actually beyond its mandate. It's outside its legal remit. Um, we have a different point of view, say, in Italy, where there's a question whether the ECB is even-handed in the way it supervises banks. Is it maybe tougher on Italian banks and less tough on German banks? Um, we have concerns about that low rates sow the seeds of future bubbles and, uh, and uh, indeed future inflation. Um, we have the whole question whether asset purchases by the central bank, after all, make the rich richer and therefore exacerbate uh, inequalities. Um, and we also have the question whether through the ECB's balance sheet that expanded significantly, um, uh, there is in, indeed uh, some sort of secret uh, uh, redistribution happening across Europe, something that is not sanctioned by the politicians. 
Um, so we have this, uh, this, this, this enormous uh, discourse and this controversy, but in a sense, maybe for us as central bank, this is normal because popularity in fact is a mission impossible because we are one central bank for 19 countries of the Eurozone. And, uh, and, and that means there are different stages of the economic cycle where they might think they need different things from their central bank. They have different preferences, different economic models, and even all the way to different cultures and, and different languages that do make a difference. I'll give you one small example. At the beginning of the Euro, uh, when we started to uh, um, make cash available in all the cash machines of Europe for the changeover in 2002, um, when we moved from the experimental printing stage to the uh, industrial production of banknotes for the large scale, we wanted to issue a press release and say mass production of banknotes has started. And the German colleagues said, no, 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 you can't do this. You cannot put mass production and banknotes into the same sentence because in the German mind, it triggers immediately an association with hyperinflation and too much money chasing too few goods and services. Um, no one else in, in, in the group of central bankers had the same association. But again, that's something we need to bear in mind. Um, and in that sense, uh, maybe popularity is not really the thing that we need to be uh, looking for. Um, but, uh, uh, but this notion that we could be equally liked at all times uh, by everyone in the Eurozone, that's maybe a, a, a tall order to, to ask for. Central banks are under extreme scrutiny, as we're saying, every single word is counted, but maybe it goes even further. And I'll give you just a little a, a kind of a, a funny example of how far it can go. Um, when people are trying to decipher from the, from the color of the tie of Mario Draghi under the hashtag Draghi tie guesses, what the color of the tie would, uh, would indicate about the next monetary policy uh, decision. And as you see here on the left, um, people start to wonder whether this can be continued with Lagarde scarf guesses. That you have a similar thing. But it's not just fun. You see actually uh, AI and modern technology being used and trying to, to do facial recognition of central bankers as they walk into the press conference room, as they walk to their public pronouncement, to see from the faces whether they can decipher already something and get that little edge, those extra tenth of a second or 20 seconds or whatever, to make that first trade before the announcement comes. Um, so that just gives you an idea of how closely central bankers are being uh, watched. Um, we also have this in enormous focus on the top person. And in this case, you see here a, uh, an advert being used by a car rental company about, uh, about Mario Draghi uh, and two Italians that cause people sleepless nights. Um, this is something, it's an image. Mario Draghi is, is, was a, uh, a public persona. There's nothing we as central bank can do about it, but just it is something that would not have happened to previous central bankers. This is a new thing that is happening uh, now. Similarly, this extreme scrutiny, the FT ran and uh, the Financial Times ran a very, uh, uh, well, probably tongue in cheek kind of uh, story about how the, the, uh, the credit card receipts of uh, Mark Carney, the, the governor at the time, which were public, were scrutinized to find out that he had uh, eaten two yogurts at Heathrow Airport. And then there was a big question, where was he flying to? Who was sitting with him? Or was he even eating two yogurts on his own? It's, it just gives you how much, how much uh, there is kind of an interest in this kind of thing. Uh, and of course, with the, the new demands for government and the sunshine, freedom of information, there's of course a lot more scope uh, for that. And then finally, what I spoke earlier, the wealth of information and the poverty of attention. That is something I think for many central bankers, is a totally new environment that it is, it is not necessarily that they will always get through. Yes, there will be some group that will hang on to the every word that a central banker says, but for a large part of the world, there's so much distraction and that we actually as a central bank, we have to make an effort in a sense to compete for attention. And the question is to what extent we ought to be doing this, what channels should we be using and so on and so forth. And again, this is just to show how the, uh, how the, the world has changed in, in so many ways. Now, moving away from the communications landscape, let's move out what's happening to central banks and the job that they're doing. And there, uh, I think the world has changed significantly, especially in the course of the, of the most recent crises. And yeah, I started with the financial crisis of 2007, the sovereign debt crisis, the low inflation environment, and now uh, the, the, the pandemic crisis. Um, we have on the one hand an increased complexity of central bank tools and of the decision-making with packages of 
of uh, asset purchases, lowering rates, tiered interest rates, and so on and so forth, which, which uh, makes it much more necessary to probably talk more about it. You also have rising uncertainty. And the question is, can people look to the central bank as the guidance um, for where the economy is going, when in fact, we're all surrounded by uncertainty. And incidentally, the ECB uh, lately has, has accompanied its projections by a scenario analysis with a mild and a severe scenario, because this pandemic and the way it's progressing is just too difficult to, to, uh, to do a proper forecast on. Um, central banks have become more powerful objectively. There have been new tasks that have been handed to central banks, in our case, the ECB, to become banking supervisor over the banking system in the entire Eurozone, and also to look after systemic risk in the, in the, in the wake of the, uh, of the great financial crisis by creating the European Systemic Risk Board. Um, the new monetary policy tools are much more controversial. People are asking themselves, what is it that, you know, that if you bring money to the bank, you actually need to pay for it rather than getting interest for it? Um, what is all this money printing that's happening out there uh, under, under the guise of quantitative easing? And that led to a politicization of, of central banking and people are asking, yeah, what's the distributional impact of that? Um, are the rich truly getting riches? And there's an impact on people's property rights. If the ECB as supervisors declares a bank failing or likely to fail, that's going to have an impact on the price uh, of, of assets that bondholders and shareholders hold. Um, and they will not be happy about this. Uh, so we, we, we see this kind of moving out of an obscure corner into something that is the center of contestation. And with it go increasing demands on what a central bank ought to be doing. Should we be doing something in climate change? You see the picture here in the, in the, in the, in the corner um, uh, about the blockify, sorry, the, the Fridays for Future uh, coming to the ECB saying you've got to do something, digital currencies. But we also have this projection of of discontent with the system that onto the ECB, because we also have such a uh, iconic skyscraper here in Frankfurt, um, but where you say this is the, the cathedral of high finance and there's something we don't like with capitalism, with financial capitalism, and that is projected onto a central bank. Again, that is not something that would have happened 15, 20 years ago. And a, and, and a, and a final point, uh, which makes the context so different, and then uh, Eric has just uh, referred to it in the recent tweet, which actually got me the idea, is these days when we speak about the economy is not so much the facts and the numbers, it is how we frame facts and numbers in a narrative and how we speak about the economy that has a massive impact. And with it, of course, the way the central bank speaks about uh, the economy that ought to be uh, looked at. Now, and here I come to something that Eric has put, put out, and that leads to a kind of a reappraisal of central roles, uh, the central bank's role and status. We say uh, maybe this corner where central banks have been in, where what they did was pretty obscure, um, these were technocrat stuff, um, it wasn't really clear what kind of impact it had on people's uh, personal uh, finances, where it was okay because there was a muted political saliency of central bank policy that interrelated with the acceptance of central bank independence. It's okay to let central banks do the job uh, um, removed from the political process precisely for these reasons. The question is, does this hold after this crisis? And in fact, some people have to push this even further here with the former chief economist of the ECB, Otmar Ising, wondering if in the course of the sovereign debt crisis, if really the ECB has ended up for lack of crisis management abilities of the politicians as the only game in town, whether well, that ultimately pushes the ECB into a corner where it is too powerful, in fact, too powerful for any democracy to abide. And, and uh, Paul Tucker has, uh, has written a, a whole book about this that speaks about unelected power. And, uh, and, and where I say there's so much that is being uh, loaded onto the shoulders of central banks because of their expertise, because of their genuine powers. There is no institution on the planet that has deeper pockets in Euro than the European Central Bank. That is the nature of a central bank, of any central bank in an economy. And that of course gives you, vis-a-vis -vis the financial markets, with the rest of the economy, uh, a, great, uh, a great influence to act fast and to act decisively and with real impact. And that has led people to say, can the ECB not do this on that? Can you not add, uh, and add more and more to the mandate until you ask yourself, if all of this stuff is now in the hands of the central bank, 
how are we holding this central bank to account? After all, all power emanates from the people in our democracies. Now, for us, that is something we need to worry about um, because uh, we, we need people to trust in our currency. Um, and why is that? Because as I show you here, this a fine little piece of printed paper um, is nothing but this. It's a piece of printed paper that has an intrinsic value of between six and 10 cents. And yet for this one here, we're willing to work hard to get 10 euros for our work and we want to spend it for stuff that we like that's also worth 10 euros. And why is this? Because it embodies a promise. And that promise is a social convention, a society convention that uh, retains that this, this representation of value retains its value. All money is a matter of belief, the father of the market economy, Adam Smith once said, and the question is how do you sustain this belief? And precisely because it's so important, Josef Schumpeter with this big quote about that's why the nation's monetary order is so incredibly important. And if you look around at places like Zimbabwe, at places like Venezuela, or indeed the interwar period in Germany, then you see that the, the fall of the monetary order uh, is often accompanied with enormous social uh, unrest and a redistribution of wealth and upheaval. And that is why it's so important for central banks to retain the trust of the people, because without it, we wouldn't be able to do our job, achieve price stability and a safe banking system, but also it retains our legitimacy and the public support for independence. And that is why trust is such a hugely important thing and why we need to care about it. Now, the point is in Europe, we are facing a trust paradox. To say it in simple terms, people love our product, the euro. Three quarters of Europeans support the single currency. And yet this, the institution that stands behind this, uh, this currency, the European Central Bank, is in fact the net trust that we have is just below 50%. Um, so we have this, this, this discrepancy and we have to ask ourselves, how can we get out of this? How can we, how can we uh, uh, go back to a reasonable situation that we had before the big financial crisis where both were roughly going together? We've started to look into this, what does trust really mean and, uh, and some of our internal research uh, looks at, uh, you know, if you ask people, what is it that you believe about the central bank? And we correlate that with their trust in the central bank. We see that the biggest impact is in fact, credibility, does the ECB do what it says? Um, and there's other elements like the success in controlling inflation and the success in, 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 in supervising banks well, that are equally important, but there's also this element of what we call the ethics. The people who believe that the ECB pays attention to the welfare of the people and that it acts responsibly tend to, uh, tend to exhibit higher trust in the ECB uh, than those who don't. So it is maybe it's just you know, a pure economist's view of central bank credibility and trust will probably just focus on, are we doing a job? Is it the output legitimacy? We're delivering a good job, therefore we should be trusted. But no, we've got to look a bit more in detail and look, you know, what is it that people associate and what they find important in order to build that trust. Now, that trust, of course, is, is now generated much differently than it used to be in the times of deference to institutions, to authority. These days, anyone who's been in a, on an a, um, Airbnb or an Uber, um, it's all much more distributed. It's peer-to-peer. It is, what does your friends, what does your family, uh, what does the guy like you and me uh, uh, say about this that has a much bigger impact on whom you trust? The Edelman Trust Barometer, one of the indicators is, is clearly pointing in that direction. Now that means we are, as a central bank, uh, are, are, are facing a, a different way of how we can go and need to rebuild trust. We, can, we can't just say, look, we're delivering your stable currency, what do you want? Um, that's just not enough. These days, we've got to go out and do more. And there's two things we've got to do is maybe talk more, but also talk differently. And here comes, well, we talk already a lot. Um, here's just some numbers uh, uh, that show you how, just how much information there is out there about uh, that we put out um, and that where we, where we kind of try to be uh, communicating with the people 
in the Eurozone, all 340 million of them, um, often in their mother tongues in, in 23 languages. Um, altogether, we are putting about 20,000 pages worth of publication out every uh, every uh, uh, year. Our board members speak everywhere, our staffers go around and speak. So there is already a lot that is, is happening. And in fact, <coughs> more and more has been coming out uh, upon uh, under, under the general drive for greater transparency, but also uh, upon requests, say the European Parliament saying it would be nice if you could publish this or that. Um, uh, when the academic community said, you know, why don't you, uh, why don't you become more open about things? And in fact, you see here some of the things that are now being put out uh, make make the, the the central bank much more transparent. And places like Transparency International, um, who have been a clear advocates uh, of saying this is a public institution, we want to know what's happening inside. Clearly, they have uh, have, have had their impact also in in making sure the central bank puts out more information. The real question we have to ask ourselves is this, can there be indeed too much? Is more information always better? And, uh, and, and then you have to ask, well, who is it good for? The famous Cui Bono. Um, there's been a very insightful paper by uh, Hyun Shin from the BIS, um, who was very worried uh, about an echo chamber that the central bank might be in together with the financial markets. So the louder the central bank talks, the more likely it is to hear its own echo, meaning the information that we hear through markets, expectations, uh, and other sort of signals from the financial markets might indeed be nothing more than a reflection of information that we have given out as a central bank through our own pronouncements. Um, and the second thing is, is the more we put out, maybe we're not enhancing the clarity of our message. It's, it's what, we, what economists call the signal to noise ratio. How much noise is there out there that it maybe drowns out the true signal? Um, I'll give you one example. The ECB's website has 180,000 pages. We could probably increase that. We have enough material to publish 500,000 pages of material. Would that help the informed decision-making of Europeans out there about saving, spending, and investing. I'm not 100% sure that ever more is really truly uh, helping uh, in clarity. So we have to ask ourselves, is really the way the, what I call the see-through central banker, ultimately, if you want to go down that route, you bring the TV cameras into the governing council meeting room. The question is, will that lead to better public policy decisions on monetary policy or not. And probably more, more than one person will probably put a big question mark behind it. Um, and, it. and that's why you have to ask yourself, maybe we're talking too much. And there of course comes the whole question about whether some of this talking too much is structural in the case of the European Central Bank where the governing council made up of six members of the executive board and 19 uh, uh, governors of national central banks uh, who speak about monetary policy, it was important to speak about it to a local audience, explain, but it might have a different opinion and in fact lead to something that's called cacophony and Ellen Blinder, um, who's uh, been saying, well, maybe a central bank that speaks in a cacophony of voices may in effect have no voice at all. Now, one thing that ought to be said is that in some jurisdiction, different points of view are being perceived as an enriching variety of views elsewhere this enriching variety is, is, is dubbed a cacophony and it's not quite clear what it's meant. So there's also a way we, uh, we, we, uh, we need to think about this. Now, maybe the most important element of all of this is, with all the stuff that we are putting out, with all the information that is available, with all the talking that's going on, is anybody really listening? Um, and that's what we call the phenomenon of rational inattention, that precisely because central banking is complex, it's difficult, uh, people might be better off to not bother much and invest time in understanding because ultimately it doesn't make a huge difference to them. And there has been a big discussion about this, maybe at a time when the notion of changing prices has become so unimportant that it disappears into the background of people's lives, it is mission accomplished for central bank. Um, people don't need to care because it doesn't really matter to them because prices are stable. 
we've done our job. But the question is, is that sufficient when the next crisis uh, hits? And you have a fantastic quote, which I would like to read out in full um, from, again, from Ellen Blinder, who wrote about the Federal Reserve. He said, relative to their economic and therefore social importance, central banks are among the least well understood institutions. For example, I have been told that millions of Americans still think that the Federal Reserve System is a system of government owned forests and wildlife preserves, where presumably bulls and bears and hawks and doves frolic together in blissful harmony. Having spent some time there, I can assure you that this is not the case. That is the insider joke for the central banker. Um, but there is, of course, uh, this whole thing, the more we put out, what is really arriving on the other end? And just now that the Fed has announced a new strategy, um, there's immediately been a study by Coibion and, and others uh, asking the people uh, what, uh, what has actually come through. And they come to this, uh, to this thing that the Fed listens indeed, but the people may not. And they say, uh, they have their finding there, they say those hearing the news about the announcement of the new strategy do not seem to have understood the announcement. They are no more likely to correctly identify the Fed's new strategy than others, nor are their expectations any different. And if you think ultimately what this communication tried to achieve in terms of policy effectiveness, it is to have an impact on people's policy uh, inflation expectations and their spending and, 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 and saving decision and borrowing decisions, then this is a pretty, a pretty tough thing uh, to, to bear in mind. And that is why I think there is a significant shift. Uh, sorry, sorry. And that is why we have to ask ourselves: How can we get through? Um, uh, how can we communicate? And do we communicate for the people or for the markets? And at this moment, I would like all of you who are on that call to take out your mobile phones, um, because I'd like to hear your view on on a couple of aspects of central bank communication, and that will then feed in into the rest of the talk. So, if you would all be so kind. Take out your mobile phones and uh, and uh, go to www.menti.com. And there you are. Once you're in there, you get prompted to insert a code, which is three four eight zero four nine two. Let's see how that works. Have you all got the code? Eric, can you be the spokesperson for the for the audience? Yeah, I think everybody's got the code here. They can see it very well. Thanks. Okay. okay. Sure. So, and there's a question here that I'd like you to ask, which is, um, which attributes do you personally associate with central bank communications? And there's more than one word you can insert. Um, just uh, put in what you what you think. We will look at that in a in a minute. I see here. How many of you have started to uh, uh, to to do this? And I see that the number goes up. Before we go to the second question, I think most people are ready for the second question. Yeah. Okay. I still, it's moving up a bit. Um, I have 43 responses. Okay, maybe I'll call it a day here and move on to the next question, which is this one. And that is, what do you think should be the ECB's top priority? And you can choose up to three um, uh, that you can tick there. And then you please uh, uh, let us just make that choice. Thank you. 
and show its age. Double key, huh? That's good enough by us. Okay. Uh, Eric, shall we uh, carry on? Yep. Okay. Then let's see, let's see what the uh, outcome is. That is uh, what the audience here thinks about a um, uh, central bank communication. Technical, complicated, complex, intractable. There's transparency, and as I said, that's uh, an interesting interest rate. Unclear, dry. I think charged with expectation, expert insights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this is a a, a very uh, a nice and insightful thing, and indeed it does um, it does square with something we've done at the Central Bank Communications Conference that uh, we did a, a few years ago, where this is what came up. And that just shows you the size of the challenge um, that if you would like to do something different, and we wouldn't like to communicate differently, um, what we are kind of trying to, what we're having to deal with. Because right now, the Central Bank speak is super complex. Here's a study of colleague, uh, colleagues of mine that looked at, uh, at policy statements of the ECB and the FOMC and looked at, uh, at the, reading, uh, the reading score. How many years of formal education do you need in order to understand them? And you see that, uh, that uh, it's, it's beyond 12 years. You at least need, so to speak, need to be uh, beyond baccalaureate, more into a kind of an undergraduate at least for some speeches, even you need a PhD to, to understand them at all. Now, all of this works well with the markets. As you see here, this is a survey done by Barclays uh, um, uh, a few years ago, but the, the, the results have remained pretty much the same. Um, the markets understand as well. Experts and markets understand as well. They find it uh, uh, reasonably predictable. And I think Alessandro could probably testify to that. It might not be super accessible, but in terms of what you want to hear as an expert from the central bank, what you need to form your expectations and be able to predict where the next interest rate move is going, um, that probably is, uh, is there. However, it does not work with the general public. Uh, we had Andy Holdane, the, uh, the chief economist of the Bank of England at this communications conference uh, uh, the, at, the, at the ECB, um, which uh, I had the pleasure of, of helping to organize and run. Um, he made these, uh, this, this uh, fantastic statement here that you see on the screen that 95% of all the words that central banks utter are inaccessible to around 95% of the population. And he added, I'm being charitable with my percentages here. So the chances are that it's maybe even beyond that. So the question is, should we shift, shift away from this? And I can, I can show you here that our new president is clearly intent is one of the key strategic goals for her mandate as the president of the European Central Bank to bring the ECB closer to the people. In a sense, the general public is the new frontier in central bank communication, something that we've also been discussing in the, uh, in the CEPR network that Alessandro referred to at the beginning. And we already have from research some insights of, uh, sorry, uh, come second thing. And that is why this is so important We've already made communications part of the ECB strategy review, and maybe in the Q&A we can talk a little bit uh, about this if, if you're interested in that. What are the various aspects of a strategy review and communications 
how we can make ourselves understood uh, uh, and, and how we can, can, you know, can make sure the policy of the ECB is truly understood and accessible to a, a broader audience than just the experts is a key element of that. And I personally am involved in a, in a work stream and co-lead that on central bank communication with other uh, experts from national central banks and the ECB. Now, how can we actually do this? And we've identified and research has identified two key ways. One is that basically goes through the mind of the person. And that is the people are aware of what we're doing. They start to build knowledge. And the more they understand about what the central bank is doing and why it's doing this, the more they tend to trust us. And that is, I say, this is, is something that goes uh, 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 through the, 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 mainly the mind. We're trying to build knowledge and understanding. And how we can do that, research has helped us uh, to, to find, I mean, to find not only this mechanism, but also what we can do about it. Uh, Andy Holden and, uh, and colleagues have uh, written about the three E's of central bank communication to the public, explanation, engagement, and education. Um, uh, other experiments uh, have shown that with simple messages or messages that are relatable to people's lives, what does it mean for me if you change interest rates, if you start purchasing assets, you as a central bank? If we can get this across, then the chances are that people have a better understanding of what the central bank does and they end up uh, tending to trust the central bank more. We at the ECB have tried to do precisely this, making the ECB understood has been a key objective for us in the communications department of the ECB. And you see some of this we were put here on, 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 on display. These are some of the explainers that we have put uh, on our website with, with visuals, with videos, but asking the questions that people have and trying to, to answer those in accessible terms um, to, to break down that enormous complexity um, that uh, is, is, is there and is such a barrier and the jargon is such a barrier to getting in touch with people. Um, a key finding also of, uh, of research is, is that people don't like complex publications. Even if you ask people who understand them, when they have a choice between an accessible text and a complicated text, even those who would be perfectly under, uh, capable of understanding the complex text, they will all choose the, uh, uh, the, the, the more accessible one. And we're doing this, what we call a layered content. So there's a top layer that gives you the core messages in visual terms. And underneath you have the full body of the analysis, but it's dense and, uh, and, and, and complexity. And we try to do this also with our financial review and other publications. And indeed we find that people stay longer on the website, they click through more, um, they, they are more interested. Uh, and we have more readers this way for our content rather than a big fat a publication that you see in the middle um, that maybe is not something that people would actually uh, find out what the core, core messages of this are. We have a growing digital presence <coughs> um, where uh, we are trying uh, through uh, on all sorts of new channels, including Instagram, really to reach people and maybe people wouldn't otherwise reach. For example, we've just gone on Instagram where we have a much younger audience and much more female audience, whereas our Twitter followers are in fact uh, those um, who, are, uh, who are mainly experts, the Twitterati, the expert, the commentators, um, who are very, very much interested in, uh, in, in details and technical aspects. And of course, we are helped by this, by the prominence of our new president, who is a global personality, uh, coming from a previous job as, a, as, a, uh, as the managing director of the IMF, um, who is in a sense, someone who can reach out to completely new audiences uh, including your almost 6 million Weibo followers in China, um, who probably otherwise would never have heard of the European Central Bank, and where we're through accessible content, we can make, we can try to help uh, to kind of make people understand what we do, and that we're there to serve them and the needs that they have. We try new formats and audiences, uh, live Twitter chats, uh, where you can ask <clears throat> on Twitter things uh, to our top personnel, uh, youth dialogues. We've done a, a game on Quiz Clash, uh, the 20th anniversary of the Euro. There's 1.6 million people, young people, played the game, learned about the ECB. These are probably people who would have never have reached through normal channels. And we're trying to to show the human face of the central bank. These are our colleagues who go out and explain what they do and what the central bank does and why this matters. It's equally with the podcast, trying to find a channel 
um, that is interesting where we get uh, through to new audiences. Now, the point is, what do we really want to achieve? We will never be in the same league as, as some others. I just put here out Justin Bieber with 112 million followers. That is not something we're, we're aiming at. We're trying to use these channels to get through, but ultimately uh, we are not there to kind of, you know, to generate clicks at all costs. Um, it is one, it's a growing channel, especially for younger audiences, that we want to be present where people get their news, where they have their discussions. Um, and that is uh, what we are, we're trying to, to achieve. Uh, um, and that's always something important to bear in mind. Nothing, however, can really replace the direct interaction. And that is why not just our board members are going out and speaking, but actually our staffers are going out. We have a back to school program <clears throat> where we in, invite our staffers to go back to the school and talk about what it's like to work for Europe, what the central bank does, and maybe even to speak about what it's like to, from their village, from their hometown, to make their way into a European institution and maybe be an inspiration even for youngsters to follow a similar career path. And we've had a very good uh, feedback for that. Of course, the ECB's back to school program, we will never reach 340 million people. So maybe we have to also rely a lot more on the traditional channels, which is television, which is still a very important channel. However, uh, central bankers and going on television is not necessarily a straight uh, forward uh, thing um, because our, uh, our top personnel, I always say, they're chosen to be uh, uh, good monetary policy makers and not necessarily for their talk show uh, 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 star performance qualities. Um, so that is, is something that uh, <clears throat> um, maybe we should do more TV, but that has turned out to be uh, slightly more uh, uh, difficult uh, to, to achieve. Now, <clears throat> another way of, of trying to reach people is not to go through their mind to say, I understand what a central bank does, and that's why I support it and that's why I trust it, but to say, look, I don't think I will ever understand what you're doing, but I think you're doing the right thing. I trust you. And we have, we have institutions that have achieved this in our own sphere. For example, Deutsche Bundesbank is one of these places where lots of Germans have an enormous trust in the Bundesbank, even though they probably hardly understand what it does. And that they build up something, they build up a brand that people say, I don't quite know what you do, um, but I instinctively trust you. And, uh, and, uh, and this, is one, this is one way we can also kind of reach, kind of build trust again uh, by going down this route. And one key element is to, to make that what we do relevant and interesting to people. And that is where I go back exactly to uh, your second question. Um, and I go here and share this. Um, and look what we've done, what you've said last time, what the ECB should do, what should be the priority. And I see you've been very well briefed, um, but you see a lot of people keep prices stable. And the second one is indeed the second mandate, which is uh, to supervise banks. But thereafter, we already got other things. We've got the support of full employment. We've got climate change, global standing, uh, better communication and listening, uh, tackle exclusion. I don't see the other, what's the last one on the right? Okay, okay. Um, so we see, we see different, different topics that uh, matter to people. And the question is, should we as a central bank maybe start at least talk about this, what we can do, what we cannot do, in order to, uh, to uh, craft ourselves, to attach ourselves to conversations that matter to people. Um, and so let me go back to, uh, to this. And in fact, this is one of the things that we've also learned through focus groups, we've learned about this, uh, what people do care about. And indeed, you know, one of the elements that people care about is indeed uh, climate change. And that is uh, something that we have started to also look into, and we can have a discussion later on. Not only because it's a topic that is very much in the limelight, but also what central banks can contribute to this um, is, a, is something that people care about, including Greta Thunberg, that has led to a reflection inside central banking circles, starting with our president, but also other members of the board and elsewhere in the central banking community, 
what is the role that central banks can play in this big transformation towards a carbon neutral economy. The second element that less with you, but that we also found from focus groups is people are very interested in technology and payments. And that is indeed just on Friday, um, those of you who might have read uh, the Italian newspaper in Corriere della Sera, uh, Fabio Panetta had a, uh, an editorial as well as on our blog and in other newspapers about why the ECB ought to be preparing and is preparing to possibly issue a digital euro. This is where the, the, the kind of digitalization progresses. And maybe as a central bank, we, we've got to be in this, in this environment. We've got to react. We've got to go with it and see the potential that's in there. Again, that's a topic. Whenever I speak to young people, um, I always hear about this, about Bitcoin, what we think about this, what we think about digital currencies, and so on and so forth. Again, there will be a chance to discuss what matters to people and say, oh, by the way, there's also an element that concerns the central bank in this. So that's where we see a potential to reach the hearts and minds, the hearts, I should say, of people um, and, 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 and get our message out. The last element of this is, of course, is that we, as a novel thing, the Fed has done this before, to make communication truly a two-way communication, not just the central bank that sends out its messages, but actually a central bank that is willing to listen and to, to hear what's going out on there, what are the issues that people are concerned about. And as part of our strategy review, uh, we are doing this. I use this occasion to invite you until the end of this month, uh, all of you in this seminar, uh, to have your say, go on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the page of the strategy review ECB listens portal and, and uh, make your voice heard that feeds into the process. And uh, one idea would be as part of the strategy review that we maybe make listening a structural part of how the central bank interacts with the people whom it serves. Um, the final element is maybe on a humorous note is the way to people's hearts is through emotion. And occasionally uh, central banks are not usually associated with great emotions, but we've done it mostly, uh, well, uh, a couple of times on Valentine's days and it has got us uh, some enormous responses, uh, even being taken up uh, in, the, in the traditional media um, uh, about those old romantics at the European Central Bank. Um, that may be unexpected, it's a new way of, uh, of relating, but it is something that uh, gets us in contact with people who otherwise probably wouldn't uh, have heard about the Central Bank. Now, my final point here is there is still so much that we still don't know about how that process happens, what happens between the sending end and the receiving end um, between the central bank and these various intermediary channels that are happening and the feedback mechanisms, how that feeds back to the central bank. And that is why the, uh, the Center for Economic Policy Research, the, the Central Bank Communication Research Network is working on this. And Alessandro was mentioned this uh, to get a better understanding. Now that we've got more data and more analysis, we have all the online data, we have text analysis. So there's an enormous potential to find out more how these mechanisms are at work and in this way to refine our communication so that we can actually get through to people in a much more effective way. And that leads me to my final observation um, to, uh, before I conclude, sorry, it's been a bit, uh, a bit longer, um, to say, or well, maybe something is actually changing. Um, Eric, you wrote this article about do central bankers dream of political union? And what we need in this situation where a lot of responsibility is put onto the shoulders of the central bank. We need an integrating Europe um, and we need more political action and agency at the, at the European level. And we find that maybe in this crisis, uh, we've seen in the, the discussion about Euro bonds, about Corona bonds, and eventually about the recovery instrument and the, and the, and the next generation Euro instrument, we have seen something like an emergence of a European public space. What we've seen is politicians not speaking at home to the home gallery and hoping to make a point abroad. No, to go directly and address the audience in a different country. You have Giuseppe Conte appearing on, on Prime TV in Germany. You have uh, um, uh, uh, Sanchez doing an editorial in a in, uh, in, in the German newspaper. You have uh, 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 Italian mayors writing an open letter, Liebe Deutsche Freunde, dear German friends, and making the case for Corona bonds, for solidarity. You have Olaf Scholz and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and Heiko Maas going out 
putting out an article in, uh, in La Stampa, in the Italian press, to address Italian voters directly. And vice versa, you have a re immediate response, uh, what you saw about you know, the, the Dutch way of looking at this and saying no extra money for the, for the, for the lazy style. But people are saying, look, hold on, it's not quite like this. Um, and saying, you know, look at the facts and, and bringing out a, a different way of looking at this. So that is, if you want the emergence of a bit of a European space and the more that happens, and indeed we've seen it with the agreement on the recovery instrument, which of course will bring a whole new set of difficult politics that when it comes to the implementation of the, uh, of the next generation EU. But I think we've seen a bit more of this happening um, and it's clear that the main action in this pandemic is first with the medical, with the medical, with, 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 with health policy, but after that, clearly with governments and fiscal policy and the central bank can play its part, but the, the, the main music plays with fiscal policy makers. And I think in that sense, this pandemic, terrible as it, as it has been uh, on the European discourse level has maybe led us uh, a couple of steps forward um, that will also ultimately make life of a central bank and its communication easier. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. It's been long. I thank you for your participation and I'm looking forward to a good discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabriel. I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite Alessandro if he wants to, to make any comments, but I also wanna invite the people both in the audience in Zoom uh, and, and in the audience here in the room uh, to ask any questions. If you're on Zoom, please put your questions in the question and answer box so that I can harvest them uh, and bring them into the conversation. If you're in the room, uh, please put up your hand and we'll recognize you in, in, in the order in which we see them. Uh, if you do ask a question in the room, um, I may have to repeat the question or I think we have a roving microphone, um, but, but when you ask the question, please give us your name uh, so that we know who you are and can keep track of the question flow, okay? Uh, Alessandro, did you want to make any comments? Oh, I just want to thank Gabriel for his very insightful, very interesting uh, talk. And I just want to add one thing uh, for the Johns Hopkins students. Uh, uh, Gabriel Glockler has kindly agreed to uh, have a career session with us, uh, which uh, normally if he had been able to come here would have been held tomorrow morning. Uh, now, of course, is in Frankfurt, uh, but uh, so we still haven't set, I think, uh, Gabriel, the date for uh, for this, but uh, he, he will do it uh, online. So for people who have even a faint interest in applying for an internship or a job at the European Central Bank, uh, I think uh, uh, Gabriel can explain all about it. So watch out for uh, an announcement about this because uh, uh, it won't be tomorrow morning, as I said, as it, as it would normally would be, but uh, it will be uh, quite soon. So uh, uh, now for the question and answer. Um, I, I see so much enthusiasm in the room. I'm going to I'm going to go to the Zoom questions first. I, I I have a couple of questions. One one I think uh, Gabriel, if you could help us understand a bit. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that are going on in, 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 uh, in monetary policy and I wonder, or, or actually Chris Lold asks, uh, how much transparency should central banks actually have uh, in, their, in their communication about the distributive consequences associated with, with quantitative easing uh, or about the distributive consequences associated with, with banking resolution? Shouldn't these be things where central banks should uh, naturally be a little bit opaque. Okay, you can hear me? Yes, yeah? Okay, great. Um, well, that's a, it's a big question how, how, uh, uh, how transparent uh, things that there's. Just to give you uh, a couple of, of points on that. I think we've seen this in all public institutions is that, that you can be very transparent in formal terms, but maybe you just drive the real discussion elsewhere. And that's probably not what people want. Um, so there's got to be a, a thinking space that is protected where also a central bank, just like other institutions, can test ideas, try something out, thinking that if we were to do this, what would that mean? 
Um, if all of this was public, um, precisely because the massive impact that, that words or information about what's happening inside the central bank has on financial markets, uh, that may, may not be a, a good idea. Now, on the distribution of consequences, maybe that brings us back to a theme that has actually been discussed in the context of the Karlsruhe, the ruling of the German Constitutional Court. And that is, uh, to what extent should the central bank always think about whether its decisions and its actions are proportionate to the aims that it likes to achieve? And in fact, that's something the ECB has done. Um, uh, maybe we can communicate more about this. To think, what will be the impact? What will be the risks and side effects of our policy? What will be the distributional consequences? Who will be better off? Who will be worse off? But also think about what will be the alternative to the actions that we have and whether in, in, in a kind of an environment where there is no one optimal policy choice at this moment in time, but where all policy choices involve trade-offs, which is the trade-off uh, that decision makers choose and for the reasons that they are proportionate to the aims and that they've been looking at all these side effects. And that's precisely what we've been doing in response and what we've been saying very clearly, we've done that for a long time, now we may be a bit more explicit about this, um, that yes, we, we, we take this into account and yes, we, we, uh, we should also be speaking about this. And in fact, Mario Draghi and others have spoken about the distribution of consequences of, of monetary policy. But that is kind of an, an ex post once we have the data coming in, but ex ante, I say, it's the, it's the assessment of the proportionality of, of the proportionateness, so to speak, of, of the actions that, uh, that we can take. There's other elements uh, like resolution, you're absolutely right, uh, where I think you wouldn't be able to do the job properly if everything was out, uh, out in the open. A, similarly, a similar example would be uh, Forex interventions. If the ECB were to pre-announce that it's willing to commit 20 billion to support currency X, you've just about ruined the instrument that you were about to deploy to the detriment of public welfare in all likelihood. And so I think there's a, an element, precisely the way markets function, that there must be uh, uh, protected spaces where we must not be entirely open. And I think this notion of what we call effective transparency, which is not this see-through, anything should be visible, but to be effective, to get the message out and to make good public policy decisions in the interest of the people, that is the thing that we need to find. And, uh, and surely there can be uh, uh, areas where the central bank can be more transparent, can lay out more things. We've had experience of this, where people got very excited. For example, I mean, Alessandro might remember um, the agreement on net financial asset, the UNFA agreement, which is a technical, relatively boring document about the assets that national central banks may hold inside the euro system. People thought there was some secret money creation happening in national central banks until we put out the document and everyone realized there's nothing to it. Here it is, it's legal stuff, the data are there, find out for yourself, and the interest died down immediately. So maybe on that front, sometimes it's better to put a few more things and, and uh, that's sometimes a very good strategy. So I have two more, two more questions online that I'm gonna do and then I'm gonna to go to the room. I've got three people who, or four people who, who've already sort of bring up their hands, but I'm gonna put these two questions together. One is by Davide Tabarelli, who, who reminds us that it's been the 30th anniversary of, of German unification. And in this kind of a context, I, I, I think the thrust of his question is, you know, to what extent is the ECB still a little bit wary of the emotional attachment that Germans have to the Deutschmark as opposed to, uh, as opposed to the Euro and, and that despite the 75% figure that you showed. So that would be one question. And the other question uh, comes from, from Ita Rusugo, uh, and, and his question is, is you know, well, wait a minute, you know, I understand that you want to make all this communication simple, but, but as you simplify central banking communication, make it more easily understood by people uh, who are listening to you, don't you create the, the real opportunity uh, to generate confusion, particularly among those more specialist audiences? And I, I, you know, I'm going to throw my little wrinkle in on that. You know, wouldn't, wouldn't we characterize that as a kind of a March 12th type situation, right? Where, where you say something, it sounds like it's right, but the specialist audiences interpret it uh, in, in entirely differently. So if you could hit those two, uh, the emotional side and the simplification side, then, um, then we can turn to the people in the room after that. Yeah. Maybe I'll first on the, on, on the, on the German uh, question, 
I think there's a, it's a very interesting question, okay, because it's 30 years on. I think the number that I have heard something like, there's 38% of Europeans who are young enough to not have a conscious memory of national currencies. And much of our narrative is about how a single currency is great and it supersedes, uh, you know, forex volatility and so on and so forth. Is maybe a narrative for a generation that will not be with us for, 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 for long. And we have to focus on the new generation that knows nothing but the euro. And in fact, this thing I showed you about, do you support the euro, which we are very happy about these three quarters of Europeans who support the euro, but eventually we're gonna to come to a situation where this is gonna be a meaning, a question like asking Americans, do you support the US dollar? And people say, what do you mean? It's my currency manage it well to the benefit of the people. But it's not a question whether you need to support it or not support it. I think that's where we, where we uh, so need to come. A second point on the, on the German thing is, that's precisely one of those things where we also have deal with a very entrenched narrative that in the old days, everything was better and the facts just don't bear it out. The Euro is a more stable currency than the Deutsche Mark has ever been. In the decades prior to 1999, inflation rates in Germany into the Deutschmarks were on average higher than they have been since uh, the start of the Euro uh, and, and the common currency. And to continuously go out, and sometimes you just have to repeat and repeat and repeat, um, that is maybe one way we need to uh, do that. Second point about simple, but not simplistic. Now, of course, that is a, a crucial element of why communication in central banking is so difficult. On the one hand, and we also have that in our own central banking circles, well, people say, um, and I think I, I'm, I'm wrong to quote, for example, uh, Utma Ising and his latest contribution, the Brunner lecture he's given about central bank communication, is probably in that camp to say, look, the world is complex. And any attempt to make it less complex than it is, is maybe not doing the people a service. Um, at the same time, I think most of, 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 of us who have worked in technocratic institutions, we have dealt with policymakers, probably realize there's a lot of jargon, there's a lot of extra complexity that is often added on, um, especially in a risk averse institution like a central bank, that is not actually necessary to convey the true message. Um, but what is absolutely right, and that is what you, what you refer to, Eric, is of course, as a central bank, we're continuously communicating to many audiences at the same time. Um, and, uh, and precisely because of modern technology and so on and so forth, people having their web crawlers that will pick up any ECB statement anywhere, um, that's, uh, so you cannot just go and, and speak in very, very simple terms uh, about the exchange rate, say, in, a, in some sort of small town event somewhere in the south of France and not think that it might be picked up. And next thing you have a, 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 Reuters, a, a Reuters piece or a Bloomberg news on your, on your trading screen. Um, and I think that's, uh, uh, that's uh, something that we've learned the hard way during the uh, uh, financial crisis. Um, just to give you one example, Angela Merkel in the middle of the, uh, sorry, on the sovereign debt crisis saying, if the Euro, if the Euro is at stake, Europe is at stake, there was a one-liner that came across the, uh, the, uh, the news wires, which was Merkel questioned survival of single currency. Now, if you're a trader out there in, in Singapore, you press the sell button. Um, and, and that's, of course, a, a great difficulty. Jay Powell had a similar thing, trying to explain the US economy in simple terms. The US economy is doing well, is in the right place. Um, uh, but I think we should still not give up and, and say we stay in our jargonous uh, kind of uh, fortress, I think it's still worth the effort to say something that is correct and yet make it understandable and relatable to the people. Okay, I'm gonna bring in uh, two questions right now. I've got a, a woman in the center right here and then I'll bring in more on the side. Um, hi, thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. My name is Sahar. Um, I'm originally from California, and my question is specifically about international communication. Um, obviously, the target audience for ECB is the Europeans, but the monetary policy that you all have has far-reaching impact. So how do you all approach international communication differently? 
So um, can we get Moritz as well, and then we'll put them together. Hi, my name is Moritz Lutroth. I'm from Germany, so I'm one of the you know, citizens. Um, uh, thanks, first of all, for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, though I've been somehow wondering throughout the entire presentation whether in the pursuit of trust and public support, you might actually be achieving the contrary. So if you think of, you know, uh, people that in these you know, very politically charged days are very trusted, they are those who are mostly unpolitical. Say Dr. Fauci, for example, in the current coronavirus pandemic, you know, been lauded uh, for his very fact-based approach to things. And uh, I mean, that traditionally is right up the ballpark of the ECB or, or of central banks generally. Um, now, However, I'm wondering in the presentation that you know laid out and, and given the very expansive set of tasks that political leaders in Europe are giving the ECB in a way also so while you know, not actually you know, moving uh, fiscal integration or economic integration forward, you might actually be achieving the contrary to what you're actually intending to achieve, namely you get more politically, you communi communicate more politically. And as a result, those people who tend to, you know, not necessarily follow your political viewpoint actually trust you less and you achieve, you know, the, an unintended result. So how do you so square the circle of being more engaged, more active, yet not staying, not becoming political? Okay. Um, yes. And maybe first, start first with the one on, on international communication. Um, I think it's fair to say, so we have a mandate and we have a commitment to the people of Europe and this is our prime audience. And I think if you speak to, uh, you know, officers at the, at the Federal Reserve, they would also say, uh, this is who we serve and this is uh, what, what counts most for us. Clearly, we are in contact internationally via the G7, the G20, the Bank for International Settlements, so there's a, a, an active international community of central bankers. And once something has been agreed there, um, of course, we stick to that language, be it the language of the G20 and the G7 on exchange rates, on trade and protectionism. And so whenever there's a new communique, I think you can rely on Europeans as, if you want, um, instinctive multilateralists um, to, uh, to take a, a, strong, uh, a strong support to what's been agreed and to actually uh, uh, make sure uh, the message ab about this uh, gets out. So in that sense, uh, it's kind of a globalist, uh, multilateralist com commitment. But the way we speak to the people that is, after all, don't forget, we, we speak in a monetary union of 19 different uh, countries that already makes, gives an added complexity to anything compared to a central bank in a nation state. Um, so that kind of keeps us kind of busy very much already. Uh, now, the second question about uh, uh, getting too much involved and therefore courting controversy, if I can, can rephrase that. I think there's a, a John Cochrane, uh, the, the grumpy economist, if you, if, you watch the, uh, if you watch his blog, he's probably of the same opinion. He says, don't even go near what he calls the, the hot button issues of partisan politics. Climate change is one of those. Uh, inequality, distribution of income. These are all topics that you can only lose. Say, stay out as a central bank. Um, this, this is none your territory. And I think you're kind of, uh, uh, kind of arguing slightly uh, in, a, in, a, in a different, in a different uh, uh, perception. The point is, if we were to completely stay out, and that is what I said earlier, if you have a notion that the central bank delivers its job, Prices, changes in prices don't really matter for much. I care about the things that matter in my life, my children, my family, my job, my next holiday, overcoming the pandemic, making sure everyone stays safe and healthy. Um, that's great. Um, and that's a kind of, as a, as, a, as a state, that may be something that's worth achieving. However, when the next crisis hits and suddenly the central bank is back in the center of attention, Suddenly, uh, and, and you're German, and suddenly if target two imbalances become the talk of the Sunday evening talk shows, if the expropriation of the saver is splattered all over the Bildzeitung um, with Count Dragula, then 
we need a reservoir of people who understand what we're doing. We need a reservoir of people who say, yes, uh, maybe I understand what they're doing, they're doing the right thing, I still trust them. Or a reservoir of people who say, I'm not 100% what they're sure what they're doing, but they do the right thing. They have done the right thing in the past and I trust they do the right thing. And how can we build this? Well, that's the way I've explained earlier. We probably have to enter into conversations uh, that matter to people. And one element of staying a bit out of the controversy that you mentioned is to not just say, this is what we can do, but to also be very explicit about what we cannot do. The central bank has a limited mandate, has a limited set of tools that it has been given by the legislator, by the people, for a pursuit of a particular mandate. And we also got to make clear that, yes, this is what we're doing, that's our job, but this is where it ends and we cannot do more. And so these are two sides of the same set of communication. Excellent. I've got Marit Sohuba and Hans Maul. Uh, hello, my name is also Moritz. Thank you so much for the insightful talk. Um, you presented some of the um, studies that you've done on the ECB's reputation and the trust that people have in the institution. And I was sort of surprised to not um, to not have heard about a, a, a differentiation between different Eurozone countries. I mean, there are 19 countries and I could imagine that the ECB is quite differently perceived and its communications are differently um, perceived in the Netherlands and, and Greece, say, for instance. And as a second point, um, how much of a role does representation play in the communications? And do you think that the geographical and the, and the gender composition of the board could enhance uh, the credibility and trust that people have in the institution? Thank you. Um, Hans Mal, who's the professor back there. Thank you, I'm Hans Mal, and I'm teaching here on East Asian security. And I will tell you, I don't understand much about the subject here. Uh, very much appreciated your presentation, but I really have a follow-up question on the previous Moritz uh, sort of criticism. Uh, I noticed uh, from your presentation that the gap which you mentioned, uh, the trust gap of the European Central Bank, started opening in 2008 with the financial crisis, not very surpri surprisingly, and it, uh, it got worse all the time, although you have obviously taken a lot of effort to communicate more effectively. And that led me to reflect on the question, you know, what is it? Perhaps you are sort of missing something here. And I'm wondering, um, I mean, your presentation in many ways came across to me uh, uh, as an effort to better sell a product. Now, the question is, uh, where is the communication about the quality of the product? Isn't that something you should be uh, also uh, sort of uh, taking into consideration? And maybe that's where the problem is, or at least part of the problem is for this gap which refuses to close, although you would take lots of additional efforts to close it. Over to you, Gabriel. <laughs> what do you mean? Okay, great. Um, first, uh, on, on the question on the, uh, on the, on the reputation. You're absolutely right. I just showed aggregate figures for, for, the, uh, uh, for, for the shortness of time. There was enough material I, I think I presented. Of course, there are, are great differences. And it is no doubt that you know, some of the deepest uh, a fall in trust we've seen in countries where the sovereign debt crisis hit the hardest. And in this, I think it's also no, uh, no, uh, uh, no secret to say that the ECB's participation in the Troika and the monitoring of the adjustment programs in those countries has not helped the ECB brand. Let's just say it in, this, in, the, in those terms. Greece, Cyprus, part in Spain, Ireland, Portugal, um, also Italy are, are places where, where trust in the ECB has been, uh, has been uh, low and where we obviously, you know, kind of, we, we were associated with something that many people consider the wrong policy, uh, policy prescription. We've also seen trust decline in countries like Germany and the Netherlands. And there it is for, for different reasons. Um, and that it has to do with some of the narratives that have been built. And again, I can refer you to, uh, to uh, the great work that our board member Isabel Schnabel has been doing, going out and doing a bit of myth busting about the alleged appropriation of the saver. When in fact, real interest rates 
on, on deposits for, for German savers have been negative way before the euro. And in fact, the expropriation of the saver has been a constant feature through the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. There have been periods when, yes, you got nominal rates of 2 or 3%, but inflation was 4%. Then at the end of the year, you were, were worse off. No one talked about it because you still saw a nominal, a nominal return on your savings. Now, to put out the facts, the same, you should talk about the zombification of, of, of banks and companies, about uh, you know, the various other myths that are out there about how you know, the, the banking system is, is under enormous strain because of the ECB's low interest. I mean, I myself had a letter from my uh, local savings uh, in the letter, due to the ECB's interest rate policy, we have to start charging uh, fees for the following services. Now, hardly ever in a customer communication has it been so clear who is being to blame, uh, when in fact, maybe the world is slightly more complex than that. Now, if you have narratives like this settling in, and there are people like Wolfgang Münchow have been writing, but also Isabel Schnabel has been saying, this is the kind of stuff that has happened prior to Brexit in the debate about Europe in the United Kingdom. Watch out. Watch out how you talk about this and how you entrench a particular way of talking about the ECB. If for a decade, this institution that has served Germany well, I'm sorry, I'm getting to a kind of a bit of a, a German focus here, that served the economy well, otherwise it wouldn't be in, in the shape that's in, um, is being portrayed as one that is illegal, that acts outside the remits, that is, uh, that is not doing the right kind of thing, and overall is doing a bad thing for German savers. If that is entrenched and no one speaks up against it, we've got a problem. We've got a problem. And I think these are some of the things that, that one needs to bear in mind. And that also leads me to, in a sense, to the, to the second question, um, is to talk about the quality of the product, yes, we are trying to talk about the quality of the product. The most stable currency that, uh, that there has been, say, on German soil um, for quite a while. Um, a, 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 a currency that has, has helped this economy to grow, that has helped the Eurozone grow. Um, not in all parts of the Eurozone, it's been the same success. There's also no doubt about this. But it's very interesting that in some of the parts that have done best out of the single currency, we have uh, some of the biggest criticism about the alleged quality uh, of uh, the product. And I think uh, and that leads us back to communication. Sometimes it's just to go out and time and again and repeat the message and repeat uh, 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 just the facts, put out facts and figures and arguments to, uh, to, to basically destroy the myths and bring out uh, what the facts stand for. Gabriel, that was uh, that was a fabulous way to close this off. I'm going to invite Alessandro to to, to say something uh, if he has more to say. But this is such a great and rich conversation, so I really appreciate it, Alessandro. Well, I just want to thank uh, Gabriel for his talk and everybody for being still here at eight o'clock. Uh, if you had been able to come, we would have been able to enjoy a nice dinner in Bologna, but maybe next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That was really terrific, man. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.